Olá, pessoal. Boa tarde, boa noite. Sejam bem-vindos a essa sessão. Todo mundo entrando, temos um bom grupo aqui. Sejam bem-vindos, é um prazer estar aqui hoje com vocês. Eu sou a Nelise Hoffman, Country Coordinator do Education USA, essa rede que representa todas as universidades americanas. Nós estamos aqui com vários participantes que vão estar falando com vocês hoje. O Education USA é a nossa rede global de é, orientações sobre estudos nos Estados Unidos. Nós fazemos parte do Departamento de Estado americano e o nosso objetivo é oferecer informações atualizadas, é, precisas, abrangentes sobre os estudos nos Estados Unidos em nível superior. Então, esse evento aqui está trazendo diversas instituições ao longo dessa semana. Hoje vocês vão conversar com vários deles e vão ter a oportunidade tanto de trazer informações para nós aqui, é, perguntas, tá? vocês tragam é, usando a nossa aba do Q&A, a parte do chat, e depois vocês vão poder conversar diretamente com os representantes nas salas do Zoom. Nós vamos pôr os links no final, tá bom? Então, agora nós vamos transition to English, so you can talk with our representatives. So, let's start. Please, the first representative can begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody, on behalf of uh, so many of us. We're going to do some introductions. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, just one second here, but my uh, name is Stacy Aquero, and today we are thrilled to be here to talk to you about the do's and don'ts of undergraduate international student applications. So there's many subtops, subtopics that we are going to speak about, um, but first I'm just going to give the stage to each of my colleagues to give a quick introduction. Again, my name is Stacy Aquero. I am from Stony Brook University which is on the East Coast in New York. And I'll pass it on uh, to uh, Vicki. Hi, everyone. My name is Vicki Seafelt West. I am from Ohio University, which you can see there is on the edge of the Midwestern United States. And pass it on to Lauren. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Perry, and I'm with Albion College, which is in Michigan, also in the Midwest. Luis. Hi, everyone. My name is Luis de Jesus. I'm Brazilian as well, and I work for Dallas Baptist University in Texas, southwest part of the United States. Welcome to this meeting. Uh, Robert. Hello, everybody. Boa tarde. My name is Robert Carlin. I am with California State University, San Marcos. We're located just about 30 minutes from downtown San Diego on the west coast of the United States. And hey, everyone. Lorenzo. Yeah, thanks, Robert. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, joining us uh, tonight. My name is Lorenzo Wilcox, and I'm here representing the University of Oregon. And uh, we are located in the Pacific Northwest region of the U.S. in the city of Eugene, Oregon. Great. So we're going to go ahead um, and just a quick overview. Um, as I said, there's going to be a little bit of subtopics. We're going to talk about some a variety of different application topics. Um, or application types. Uh, there's, believe it or not, several different application types that you can use to apply to different schools. Uh, we're gonna talk about English proficiency versus test optional. Um, some college essay tips, extracurricular activities, as well as letters of recommendation. Keep in mind, all of these topics could be, you know, probably we could talk about them for each over an hour. So this is really just an overview, but um, that's what the Q&A is for, as well as our, our individual sessions afterwards, you can you know, come and talk to us about general information as well. Um, but when you're talking about colleges in the United States, we want you to remember that there are over 4,000 different colleges and universities in the United States. And a lot of times we use that word college and university uh, interchangeably. Uh, college is not sort of high school level, which we know um, can be sometimes confusing for international students. But many institutions will accept um, some application systems that are universal to many different schools. So hundreds of different schools will belong to what is known as the common application um, or the coalition application or even both. 
You don't have to use both of those applications. You can choose one of them as long as that school is a part of that application system. And what's really great about both of these application systems is that you can apply to multiple schools uh, using one of those applications and have some of your basic information done and then just have to do individual information for each of the schools you are applying to. One thing I like to remind students of or let students know when choosing any of these application systems, even though it is considered a common application and you're applying to multiple schools using one application, it is still a separate application fee for each of the schools you are applying to, as well as separate questions for each of the um, schools you're applying to. So you are submitting it per school you're applying to. So some students kind of get through the application and, and don't realize that they have to submit for each one and answer some individual questions. So it's really important to make sure that you are um, submitting that. Um, many of us here today are part of state institutions um, or, um, or, or through a state system. So in the United States, universities can be public or private. Uh, when you're a part of a public institution, you're a part of the state system. Private institution, most of the time your public institutions means that you're funded by uh, or the university is funded by partially by the state you are at. Um, so I'm part of the State University of New York. You have Robert um, in California, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some state applications in a little bit. Additionally, uh, many institutions will have their own application. Some of them will accept things like the common application or their own application. So there's a combination of different ways you can apply um, and, what will become a theme, not only tonight, but throughout your entire experience of searching for colleges and applying for colleges, is that every school is different. So it's really important when looking at schools to be organized. Um, and I always say organization is your friend. I am a big Google Sheet or Excel spreadsheet kind of person. But I also recognize that everyone has their own organizational system and you have to do what works for you. Um, so first off, when you are um, applying to schools and if you're using things like the common application or the coalition application, almost everything is going to be online and you're gonna have separate usernames and passwords and IDs for every application type you use and then every school that you are actually applying to. Um, this also goes the same for any testing agency that you might use to take, whether it's an English proficiency exam or a standardized test such as the SAT or ACT. So really um, keeping an organizational record of all of these types of different accounts that you have to create with usernames and passwords. Obviously, um, uh, creating something that's that's sort of around a college theme sometimes makes sense. I often say create one email for you to apply to all colleges with. Um, I also, again, I'm sort of an organizational nerd. Um, so I like to create labels and folders in that email box um, per college. That way you can drag things in there and move things and stay organized. I also think it's really helpful to have another tab in that sort of spreadsheet or again, any organizational system that you have. Now that you are looking at different schools and I use Stony Brook as an example, of course, but of course this um, applies to anyone is, you know, what application type did I use? What is the deadline that I have to apply for? When did I actually submit it? When did I submit some of these other things? And then, like I said, once you apply to schools like Stony Brook, now you're gonna get even more usernames and passwords and IDs from each individual school. I will often have a, a student call and say, you know, I haven't received anything from you. And sometimes that application didn't get submit. Sometimes it didn't hit the submit button. So if you know that you apply through the Common App around a certain day, 
we can go look in, in our records and be able to see um, what it is. Of course, at the same time, even if you're calling just to say, hey, I wanna check on the status of my application, having that ID number um, that's associated with your account in each individual school is gonna be really important. Lastly, just a few um, common mistakes when filling out an application in general, doesn't matter which application type it is. Um, we really wanna say that you should use the name uh, that's on your passport because that's going to then in turn um, not only be your official record for the university, but typically is gonna be your name on your I-20 document, which is the document used to then apply to, for your F-1 visa at your embassies. Um, your, your name should be the same as on your test scores and transcripts as well, because we get everything electronically nowadays, especially with COVID. And if your name is spelled differently or if it's inverted, um, you know, surname, first name versus first name, surname, things don't always match up. And, and you want to make sure that, that, of course, all of the documents get to your application. Uh, many of our schools are very large and we receive, um, in all honesty, millions of, of documents um, a year electronically. So it can um, save a lot of time to make sure all of your names are exactly the same on all of your documents. Um, that email address that I talked about should be, uh, again, that same one and checked often because all of the schools are going to bombard you with emails um, reminding you to submit documents and then, of course, throughout the process of different things. Another common mistake is, you know, in the U.S., we like to be the oddballs out and have to put um, the month for, our, for any dates. We put the month, the day, and then the year versus day first and then the month. So when putting your date of birth, try to remember to put it in, in sort of a US uh, format. That way, again, things match up in our systems more smoothly when sending in documents. I am now going to transition to uh, Robert to talk specifically about uh, some of the state system applications. Stacey, thank you so much. I, I, where were you when I was filling out all my applications <laughs> way back when? Many, many years ago. So um, really sage advice as far as those things are concerned. But it was paper pretty, back then, right? right. We, we well, were the paper yeah, generation. For, Sorry for, to, to, to out you, a, but I definitely was. <laughs> yeah. It was it was stones and uh, stones and chisels in my day. So very, very old. So um, I wanted to mention to, to all of you about the, the state university system. So I'm, I'm going to use the California State University system application as a reference point, but this will pretty much apply to, you know, other state university systems. You know, in California, we're, we're divided into three uh, primary areas as far as public universities. It's the University of California system, which offer the PhD programs, right? Those are the primary research oriented institutions and there are nine of them. The California State University system, which there are 23 of them of which my campus is one. And then the community college system in California as well. So those are usually the first two years. And we each have our own common application, I guess is how we would describe it though. They're, they're, students are required to fill out um, the system application for that which you're applying. So if you want to apply to University of California at Los Angeles and Cal State San Marcos, unfortunately, you're going to have to use two separate applications for that. Same with the community colleges. But that being said, some of the things that we want to make sure that um, students think about. So when you're applying for, for, usually for a degree program in the United States, um, you're primarily going to be focusing on what we call the F1 visa category. You probably have heard that word a lot. But that's the immigration category that oftentimes students will come to the United States on what we call F1. Why it's called F, I don't know, but that's what it is. J's are primarily for students who are coming for a semester on an exchange partnership, or they're researchers, or they're being sponsored by a government or something along those lines. But it's very important for you to, when looking at these applications, to know that F1 is primarily going to be the catch-all category for you when it comes to the uh, selection process for that. So, so the question is going to ask, you know, what's your residency? And first of all, you're going to say, well, I'm an international student, but I'm coming on an F1 visa. That helps us 
to streamline you from the students who are permanent residents here in the United States or somebody who might be in refugee status, et cetera. So F1 is the key to remember. If we go to the next slide. <clears throat> so with, with the system applications that many institutions will do, again, like Stacy mentioned, you're going to need to apply, um, uh, pay a fee for each of those application fees. Right now, we're not uh, requiring an application fee, but all that being said, it's very important that you click on the institutions that you really want to apply to. As I mentioned, in, in my system, there's 23 campuses, right? So, and a bunch of us offer history or biology or what have you. So when you're filling out the application, in that toggle pull down, make sure you're indicating the, the campus or campuses or the institutions that you want to apply to, right? Sometimes we'll get phone calls from students or parents or the Education USA office saying, look, we haven't heard from, from you regarding our student application. Come to find out the student ended up clicking on the wrong application institution and therefore the information all went in an, in an opposite direction. So we might have your ACT or SAT scores, we may have your, your personal statement, we may have your, um, uh, you know, an unofficial copy of your transcript, uh, but we don't have any application because by accident and it's understandable that you would actually have clicked to the wrong institution. So, so be mindful of that as well, check off. And, okay, next slide. Right, so in the Cal State system, we have what we call quadrants, and you'll find this on the common application as well. Personal information, you know, where you're from, what's your citizenship, that type of thing. Your academic history, are you in high school? Are you currently a university student who's thinking about transferring to the United States? Are you thinking about going on to graduate level, right? So that'll be another quadrant. Supporting information is usually the documentation, um, uh, information about how we're going to um, make sure your immigration documentation lines up, and then program materials. Um, sometimes this will entail things like, okay, you need to upload um, two letters of reference, or you might need to include uh, a statement of purpose. So it's very important that you have a general understanding of the layout of what these um, general portals are as far as um, system applications are. And then, you know, if you're studying outside of the United States, it's very important, obviously, to check, yes, that you're in, in a high school overseas as opposed to the United States, right? Um, because that's where we then start um, looking at um, the names of those institutions, the grading scale, you know, you might be on a 10-point scale or a 4.0 scale and whatnot. That helps the, uh, us in the application process to, to automatically uh, dovetail in. And then, obviously, if you're taking courses like um, uh, advanced placement, or you're in an international baccalaureate program, or you're taking A-levels and whatnot, those things are going to be really critical for us in terms of evaluating you as it relates to that. Now, my institution is part of the Cal State application. I will say that um, sometimes students get stuck, um, not very often, but when they do, they can certainly reach out and is as often with many universities, they'll have a either a, a, a PDF fillable application that you can easily switch to. So if you do find yourself getting stuck with a common application or a system application, you know, don't hesitate to contact the institution to say, hey, look, you know, I'm having difficulties with this. Um, is there another way that I can get my information to you? And then a couple of other things, as we mentioned, you know, in the Cal State system, for example, once you once you finalize, you hit submit, um, you can't go back in and make the changes to the application, which is a bit problematic. So what we ask that you do is reach out to, you know, the admissions team who will be happy to go ahead. They have special magic powers that they can go in and manipulate the application if they need to. But say you forgot a course that you're taking, or, um, you just found out that you, you got a straight A in that, in that biology class and wanna, you wanna change your GPA, feel free to go ahead and reach out to the admissions team. Um, in the case of the Cal State system, as is the case with the other uh, state university systems, once you hit that submit button, they want to lock it in so that they can then upload it into our portal. All right, we'll turn it over.
Sorry, I was muted. So as we transition out of the application systems, many of the state systems and the application systems will have similarities and nuances. So as I mentioned before, um, there, you know, each school will be different how it's handled. And we are all here for, for help and questions as you go through the application process. That is not only what each of our individual um, offices are for and each of us are for, but also the Education USA uh, advisors that are here on this call are also a tremendous resource for you to help with all of these questions. Um, as we transition in the application, once you are uh, completing the application process, there's a lot of documents to send in. And you've been hearing a lot of terminology perhaps over the past two years that um, many institutions are test optional, um, but still may require English proficiency. When talking about test optional, test optional um, strictly means SAT or ACT and whether or not an institution requires SAT or ACT. When considering um, or when asking if a school is test optional, keep in mind a few things that if they are test optional, um, are they test optional for, for the particular year that you are applying to? Some schools are test optional for this upcoming fall. Some are through fall 23, some are through fall 24, some are indefinitely. Um, so again, that's that, you know, every school is different and uh, you, you'll need to ask. The other thing that there are some schools that even though they are test optional for general admission, they may require SAT or ACT for specific programs for like direct admission into programs, for some honors level programs, or for some scholarship opportunities. So you would really wanna check with each institution you are applying to about that kind of requirement. Whereas most schools will require some kind and some level of English proficiency for you as an international student to apply, or even um, a US citizen who might be living outside of the US and has never um, lived or attended uh, high school um, or education in, uh, in the US. Um, many schools will offer a variety of these different types of exams that are on your screen. Um, and each school will have different minimum requirements as to what those um, test scores will be. So many schools will offer the TOEFL and there are different versions of the TOEFL. So not every school will accept each of the different versions. So that's, yes, that can be confusing and you want to really reach out to schools and see um, and make sure that they accept the tests that you are going to take. Um, but TOEFL, IELTS, Duolingo are generally the most common and most popular. All three of them have online at home versions now um, since COVID and many institutions are still accepting them and accepting the uh, at home version. Other exams include PTE. Some schools will use AP English if, if you are taking that in your curriculum or A-level English or IB uh, English. Many schools will use the SAT or ACT English sections of that for English proficiency. What I do sort of um, caution students is if you're applying to a school test optional, but then using the SAT or ACT English, keep in mind that your total score then and the math score is also going to be viewed for admission. So if you're not meeting that overall criteria, you really want to ensure that um, that when you're submitting that. Um, and there's many more. Sometimes there's some schools will give waivers depending on if you're at an English speaking high school. So uh, this is where we, we talk about, again, contact us. Uh, we are your friends, we are your help and, and we'll help you along the way. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, talk about the college essay. All right, thank you, Stacy. And uh, yeah, hi everyone again. So. We've been talking about kind of the academic factors like your transcripts and your English proficiency scores, but now we're going to talk about the personal factors, uh, more or less, of your application. And one big component of that is the actual, you know, college essay. And, and so when you start applying for institutions, whether it is through the Common App or the other uh, application systems that we've talked about, 
uh, you'll probably encounter many spaces in which you can um, submit additional information from you know your own voice right so telling your own story the essay is kind of one big part of that but you'll also find that there's you know, an additional information section um, on an application where, you know, you could explain uh, maybe something that happened one semester or during a year in your high school where your grades lowered for a bit or there was, you know, a life circumstance uh, that took place. You can always explain that to us. We are the ones reading your application. So it's always good if it applies to you to, to let us know of those situations so that we can use it when we evaluate your application and ultimately um, benefit your evaluation. Um, there's also now you'll find like a COVID-19 essay or different, uh, you know, sections like that, that you can include more information relating to that particular topic. But what we're going to focus more in depth on today is the main college essay, the personal statement, um, and basically uh, give you some tips on how to navigate that process. Uh, so on the next slide, you'll see um, you know, a few, we're definitely not going to read all of this, but you'll see a few of uh, the essays that you can encounter uh, or the prompts that you can find uh, when you submit applications. Uh, this is taken from the Common App, but pretty much it's very similar for all, you know, application systems. Uh, the main thing that we want you to do is to really use your own voice, tell your own story. Um, that it's kind of, that's kind of the main point that you can take from this, but you'll see that a lot of these prompts want you to um, you know, maybe share a specific talent or something that makes you unique. Uh, maybe share what your passions are, what you want to accomplish through going to college, uh, you know, and, and eventually pursue as a career. Um, maybe talk about uh, a challenge or an obstacle that you've overcome um, and what you learned from it as well. So all of these are just different things that you can start thinking about as you, uh, as you apply for uh, college in the U.S. here in the future. Uh, so just know, you know, on the next slide, I'll, I'll show you some tips, um, which we can go there. But there's some do's and don'ts that are, you know, pretty much going to be obvious, but it's always good to to just do a, kind of a nice reminder of, of when you actually go through this process. Uh, and so what you want to do is, if you pick a prompt uh, that we've seen, you know, from the previous slide, make sure you answer all pieces of it, um, you know, and know that there's going to be a word limit uh, on your essay. Usually it's about 500 or 650 words maximum, which can be around a page and a half. So it's not too much space when you think about it. So you want to make sure that you're organizing yourself um, in your thoughts, uh, that you are perhaps doing an outline. It's, uh, it's going to prepare you for college, <laughs> you know, anyway, when you write those uh, essays uh, in your college classes. So you know, make sure you have that intro body and conclusion of, of what you want to say um, and make sure that you find a space to say what, you know, everything that you want to say in a concise but uh, informative manner. Um, it's also really important to use your own voice. Um, of course, don't let someone else write this for you. That's uh, no good. Uh, and, and, it's, and we're going to know it, it sounds different. Uh, you'll know uh, as well. So we want to make sure that you're sharing what you're passionate about, you're sharing who you are and, and kind of telling us information that we can't otherwise see on your application through the other factors and, and information that we've talked about. Uh, so again, make it personal and write about you, make it authentic. Uh, and uh, you know, if you don't feel comfortable writing about a particular topic, please know that you don't have to write about that stuff. We really, there's so much that you can write about um, and still share you know, who you are uh, through that process. So a few things of what not to do, of course, uh, you know, something that you should never do in, in any class, and you probably already, you probably already know this, but do not submit your first draft. Uh, you know, that's, you know, something that you want to just practice. Uh, it's, it's just a good thing to, to do, you know, make sure you review it. If you feel comfortable, ask, you know, someone that you trust to read your essay and, and maybe uh, you know, get their feedback on what it actually sounds like, how it sounds like, um, maybe any thoughts that they might have for improvement. Sometimes, you know, your English teacher or a counselor might want to, uh, might help you with that and, and give you an idea of how you can improve uh, your essay, but never submit your first draft. Uh, and along with this, check for, you know, common mistakes that students make. Uh, I think for us, one of the most common is Students put the university name on the essay, but they ended up they end up sending the essay to another institution, uh, you know, from what they listed. So that's not good. Make sure you read it thoroughly and, and you know, make sure that you um, you're representing yourself well um, on that on that statement. 
Um, do not make the essay your resume. We're going to talk a little bit more about extracurricular activities, um, but you'll find that in all the application systems, pretty much, you'll have a, a, a place where you can list different things that you've done throughout high school. Um, and so you don't have to do the same um, in your personal statement. There's going to be a space for that uh, later on. And then kind of connecting to this, don't make the essay too broad, you know, pick a specific thing that you want to talk about and really elaborate on that specific uh, event or obstacle or passion that you want to share. Uh, and then finally, and of course, do not use someone else's words. Uh, you never want to do that. Uh, but yeah, again, the main point uh, to take from this is that this is your one place to really uh, share your story and your passions and to make it authentic. Uh, because this information, uh, we're hoping that we can't get it anywhere else, right? It's just going to be your place to to share your story. So uh, just think about it that way when you start the process. Um, and now I think we're going to, I'm going to send it to my colleague to talk about extracurricular activities and what that looks like. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. I appreciate that. Hi, everyone again. Uh, so yes, we just wanted to share with you a little bit of, you know, an overview of what qualifies as an extracurricular activity and why it matters to us as admission representatives um, and counselors when we're reviewing your application to learn a little bit more about you. So I guess kind of the, the coin phrase or definition for extracurricular activities would be anything that you do in your life that's outside of your kind of regular school and or work duties um, or activities. So if you're getting paid for it, obviously that constitutes as a job uh, that you have or if it's directly correlated to you know, your school experience. Um, we don't necessarily look at that as an extracurricular um, experience for you. So what we want to know about is what do you love to do outside of school? What do you love to do outside of work? Um, why it matters to us? I, I think you know everyone will most likely agree. We want to know who you are as a human being. We want to you know look at your application holistically to better understand you as a person, to know, what, what you care about, you know, what drives you, where your passions lie, because the college experience is obviously academic based. However, it's also kind of that period of time where you're learning who you are as a human being and you're entering into adulthood. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're providing you with ways to grow and flourish, um, become the best you and feel fulfilled. And so obviously academically, we want you to feel fulfilled, but we also want you to have an assortment of different things that you can do on campus that fill your cup up, if you will. Um, and I also think that being involved and in knowing how to you know, work, uh, work with a lot of different things and manage your time effectively is super important when you're preparing for college as well. Um, so that's something that you know, just, just referencing to you and mentioning to you um, is an important thing that you're learning right now. How do you fit in your, your schooling, your extracurriculars, your family time, your friend time, your volunteering, the things that you like to do, all of that's just going to help set you up for success when you go into college and, and beyond. Um, and then the next slide we can go to, just to kind of get a bit more granular, you know, what are considered extracurriculars um, in the Brazilian context? So, you know, in general, extracurriculars is a very broad term, right? So you can off the bat recognize, of course, sports and, and any type of athletics um, is, an, is an extracurricular activity. Um, if you're involved in music or if you're involved in dance or the fine arts, uh, writing, um, art, things of that nature, extracurriculars, absolutely. Um, I think that one thing to mention here is um, we, we, we obviously know that those things are extracurriculars, but if we even broaden our lens, um, we care to know, you know, what are, what are the volunteer things that you're doing on the weekends? I know your studies take up the majority of your evenings throughout the week. So perhaps you're not involved in, in sports, perhaps you're not involved in extra, you know, after school clubs or, or things of that nature or organizations, but maybe on the weekends you work with your local church and you do different volunteerism. Perhaps there's, um, you know, a community um, organization that you're a part of that you, you know, maybe you mentor, um, maybe there's, you know, something that you're involved in, um, on, you know, on the weekends that you could share with us so we could learn a little bit more about you. Perhaps you, as part of your job, maybe there's additional tasks that are not something you're getting paid for, but it's something you're interested in. So maybe you work for a business and you love marketing. So you decide, you know, you do a lot of the graphic design or website management or social media management, that's exciting. And that's something you're doing outside of your actual, you know, work 
components and you're not getting paid for that, we would like to know about that. So just, I think thinking outside the box, you know, what are, what do you care about? What, what do you love? What are you passionate about? What are you interested in? What is uniquely you? What makes you uniquely you? Um, I know we kind of mentioned, you know, don't write down things that aren't true about you. Be super honest with us. And, and if your studies take up the majority of your time and that, that is your sole focus, write about that too to us. Um, or maybe it's, you know, family time or you do a lot of babysitting or, you know, don't make things up, but be authentic and share, share your truths with us. It's just a way for us to better understand you, get to know you, um, feel connected to you. And then if you come to our school, our in, in institutions, we can then help guide you to, but you know, if we know a little bit more about what you love, we can help guide you in different directions on campus so that we, we can share with you different clubs that might make sense for you or different organizations or teams that you might um, enjoy or love and we can meet, you know, and introduce you to the right people. So um, definitely something that we care deeply about. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about letters of recommendation. Um, as Stacy's mentioned a couple times already, you know, we've got over 4,000 universities in the United States, all of them with different requirements. So some institutions may require letters of recommendation, others may not. For my school, they happen to be optional, but I'm a big believer in letters of recommendation. So that's why I was really excited to be able to talk about this particular topic today. So my recommendation for a big do is even if it's listed as an optional um, component of your application, I would submit at least one letter of recommendation um, because they can really say a lot about you from an outside perspective. We get that um, your, the sense, your sense of self from your college essay, but we can also get an, um, a, a more well-rounded sense of you um, from someone else's perspective as well. So that's very helpful in that holistic admission process. Um, you do want to choose your recommenders very wisely. And what I mean by that is choose someone who can be who can speak about you very specifically in um, what you've done, what you've accomplished, what kind of academic promise you have, things like that. So, um, you know, oftentimes I'll see very general letters of recommendation. This is a very good student. Um, they'll do well at your university. Well, that doesn't give me a lot to go on. What I want is something from, um, you know, a counselor or from a teacher who can say, okay, you know, I taught the student for um, two years. The first year they had some challenges with the subject area, but then they were, they learned how to do this, this, and this, and they've overcome those challenges. So even if it's talking about something that you've had difficulty with, that's okay because they can really expand upon that and show how you were able to work on those areas and how determined you are. Um, and that will speak well for you going into the university um, process. So you wanna make sure that this, someone who is writing for you can very, speak very specifically about you. So someone who has worked with you um, pretty closely, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's your um, guidance counselor. So make sure that you're having regular contact with that person. Don't just pick someone necessarily from the class that you do the best in. It doesn't have to be that person. If that person doesn't know you very well, that's probably not the best option. We'll see that you do very well in that class because of your transcripts um, and because of your application. So you can choose someone who has more specific knowledge about you. Now I'm really adamant about this. Make your request early as possible. Um, your recommenders have time commitments of their own and lots of them and many of them are being asked to write many, many letters or recommendations in the case of counselors. So you really want to be respectful of their time and make sure that they have adequate time to put something together that is really reflective of who you are. Again, if they're just if you ask them the day before it's due, you may end up with a very general letter that doesn't say much about who you are. So early both for the benefit of the recommender and for yourself as well. I kind of said this already, you do want to communicate with those recommenders regularly. And by that, I mean, make sure you're, you're checking in. Okay, um, we're, 
we're uh, two weeks out now from the deadline. I just want to make sure you have all the information that you need to write the letter of recommendation. Is there anything additional or any additional information you want from me? Have meetings with them, you know, sit down and talk about, okay, these are the kinds of things that I would like the university to know about me. Can you address these in your letter of recommendation? That's great. And as a recommender, that's extremely helpful because then we know what to start really focusing in on and honing in on. And also, you know, keep us informed throughout the process as well. Keep the recommenders informed throughout the process. If you are successful in any of your admissions that their letters of recommendation were part of, let them know that and say thank you. Please do that. I mean, again, it's, it's not an easy thing to do letters of recommendation. It takes some creativity definitely takes a lot of time. So you want to make sure that you are duly appreciative um, of the folks that have taken the time to do this for you. Um, but there are a lot of different ways that you can do this very successfully, but I would recommend recommendations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Luis, who can talk about the flip side of what not to do. Thank you, Vicky. Well, as my colleague Vicky has said, that things we need to do correctly to succeed. And that's the thing I wanna tell about you, to you about keep calm and don't do it, okay? You make sure when you submit your letters of a recommendation, but before you do that, you must talk with your recommenders. So first thing you cannot do it, do not wait to the last minute to speak with them, to ask them. I have students has been asking the recommenders Hey, can you do this? I just have 24 hours. I have less than a week. And most of the times they have hundreds of applicants in the university or dozens that still in the same process as you. So please, if you're gonna ask a recommender, someone to send out a letter for recommendation, give it time to them. Ask them to do on time, with time. And they also be regularly speak to them, remind them. That's what my colleague was mentioned as well. You need to Keep in tracking, regularly speak to them, remind them. But of course, don't bother the people because sometimes they can drop the ball and say, you know what, you better find someone else. I don't have time. So please give it time to the person as well. So do not wait to the last minute to ask. Second thing, don't pick someone who cannot speak specifically about your attributes, about you, about your skills, your talents. You are a skilled person. You are so talented. You have so many things that you can bless someone, you can help someone, you can support someone. So make sure the person that you're going to pick to be your recommender, it's someone that really know you. It can be a, a professor, can be a good friend, someone that relates to your work related, can be some community service, church service you have been involved, someone that really know you as a person holistically in all senses. So make sure do not pick someone who cannot speak specifically about you, okay? Because it, all the universities wanna know not only about your academic, about how great you are in your grades, in your academic skills, but also as a human, as a person, holistically, about you, about what you can do, things that you can achieve, awards and things like that. So it's very important because this can bring some opportunities for you in the road and your achievements academically. Third thing is don't provide. Look, do not provide false information to your recommender. What means, Luis? Simple. Sometimes we're so anxious, we're so excited, and sometimes we make emotions get so much involved that sometimes we talk a little higher or more than we're supposed to talk about us, right? So I have been this case. I have been so excited to come to the United States. I'm Brazilian born and raised, grew up in Spain. But when I come to the United States, I say, my recommend, please, please make sure my recommendation is really good, okay? And sometimes people say, no, don't worry. I, I know what to do. I know what to say. So make sure, besides you give time, besides you pick the right person to know about you, do not provide false information. Make sure the person know you. Make sure the person is free to speak freely about you. I think the universe is appreciated when my friend Vicky will say, not about like why you do much, but how you are, who you are, what you do to achieve those things. So make sure do not provide false information. 
make sure to be yourself to your recommenders and they will be do the best for you because what they recommend want for you to succeed in life. And the fourth thing, do not get upset if someone says, no, I cannot do the recommendation for you. What? Are you sure? Come on, I'm wasting my time. No, 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 please do not do that, okay? I have students before, they have been upset, they have been report to the universe, oh, my recommend has been doing this, this, that. No, no, no. Make sure you know you have options, you have someone that can write for you, someone that can reply to you, can send a recommendation, and be patient. I think the word here is be patient, be polite, be gracious, extend grace, grace, grace to the people, be gracious to them. Okay, you have time, please, be in contact with them, remind them to submit the recommendation letter. If they say no in the last minute, go and find someone else, someone else that knows you better. And the last but not the least, as my friend reminded as well, do not forget to say thanks or thank you. Obrigado, muito obrigado. It's very important to show kindness, respect to someone because always I tell my student, do not close the doors. You never know what can happen in the future. Do not turn apart the bridge. You never know when you need to cross the river. So all the time, make sure you be polite, you be patient, you be kind, you be gracious to people. I hope you enjoyed this time. Now I'm gonna pass to my friend, Richard, who's gonna speak about his university. Great, thanks, Luis. And uh, be, for the sake of time and whatnot, we're going to do a very quick overview of each of our institutions. I think that will give you some idea, a little bit about you know, each of us and, and, and such. So California State University, San Marcos, I mentioned, uh, we're a medium-sized university, not too big, not too small public university, about 30 minutes from downtown San Diego at about an hour and a half on a good day with traffic to LA and a bad day about three hours. But lots of uh, support services available to you as well. You know, we do have a conditional admissions program. So if your English proficiency isn't quite up to the snuff, we do allow you to come um, with, uh, to start the university, taking some university courses as well as English language. And we do offer on-campus housing. We also offer um, shorter term programs for those of you that might not be able to come for a full degree program. We do offer semester um, or short term summer program options. If you go to the next slide, uh, Stacy. <coughs> And this just kind of gives you a general overview of the various programs we offer undergraduate as well as graduate programs at the university. Um, as you can see, soup to nuts as far as most of the programs are concerned. And you know, we do offer some scholarships, some limited scholarships for public universities. So um, we don't have as many as maybe some of my colleagues, but we do have some um, scholarship monies that are available. And you know, for Brazilian students in particular, we do offer a, a payment plan. So you're not having to write a check for the full amount while you uh, come to the university, we can, we can stretch your, your payments over a period of time. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my next colleague. It's me again. Thank you, Robert. Well, I represent Dallas Baptist University, known as a DBU, Universidade Batista de Dallas. We have over 500 international students from over 64 countries right now. The third largest group of international students are from Brazil. Actually, I'm sorry, the second one. China is the first one, Brazil is the second one, third India, the fourth Korea, and then go other nationalities. We have a beautiful campus, as you see in some of the pictures here. It's really hard to tell you how beautiful is the campus. As you notice, my colleagues here, they have beautiful universities as well. So we have a variety of options here to choose from the north to the east, from the, to the south as well, to the west. So DBU has a unique thing that it will welcome you home away from home. We have an intensive English program, IP, that we have for exchange students in, in English for communications. And as well, we have the English for academic studies for those who wanna pursue it academic, but they still need the English requirements. We have on-campus housing available. We have village, we have townhomes, we have dorms and they have apartments, all equipped, all has the futures, laundry, everything for you that you needed. We have over 3,000 students living on campus right now. For those, among them, 500 international students. The key major courses we have right now, 
that we have over 100 courses offered at DBU. Most of those courses are from the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So you have a lot of options. One of the benefits about the STEM program is right now, the West government extend OPT options up to three years in some, most of the case. So most of my colleagues here, the university offer the same STEM programs. So you have a variety of options as well to choose among not only my university, but the other ones that represent here. So if you wanna to come to Dallas Baptist University, my contact is gonna be available after this presentation, Luis with Z at dbu.edu. I'm more than welcome to welcome my Brazilian friends to DBU. Bem-vindo a Dallas Baptist University. And the next one is going to be my friend from Ohio. Thanks, Louise. So um, once again, I am from Ohio University. And um, Ohio University is a public university. And we were founded all the way back in 1804. So that makes us one of the oldest publics, like top 10 oldest public universities in the United States. Um, so we've got a really proud, long legacy of um, academic excellence. And we've got more than two. 150 different undergraduate programs that we offer. So just about anything you might be considering for study, we probably have a good match for you at Ohio. And um, we are uh, rated as a tier one or research one institution, which means that we're at the top of our research game. And that's good for you as an undergraduate student. Now, a lot of people think, oh, if you're doing research, it's master's or PhD. Well, that's not the case with us. We make sure that our undergraduate students have great opportunities to do research and get lots of hands-on experience in all of those different 250 different programs that we offer. Um, we do offer scholarship consideration for all of our international students. Um, those are merit-based scholarships. And we do try and make it as easy as possible for you to get access to that scholarship money as well, because there is no separate application for the scholarships. You just apply, and when you are admitted, you are automatically considered for those merit-based scholarships, which is fantastic. Um, we also have a, an extremely beautiful campus. I'm sorry I don't have pictures here for you, but I can tell you Expedia has ranked us in the top 15 most beautiful college campuses in the U.S., and we'll leave it at that. Right now, we're full of blossom, um, cherry blossoms. We have tons and tons of cherry trees on campus, and they're blossoming and absolutely gorgeous. Um, but we are a traditional residential campus, so you live on campus in the residence halls your first two years of your academic study, um, and then you have the choice whether you want to stay on or off campus um, after that. And we are located in what has been ranked the number one small college town in the US, which is Athens, Ohio. So it is a small town, but you're going to find everything there that you need as a student. So it's just, you know, it's a it's a big university feel, but with a much smaller kind of user friendly environment. We still have um, a 16 to one student to faculty ratio. Our class sizes are still kept under 30 students per class. So even though we're a large research institution, we give you all the benefits of a smaller um, place as well. So if you wanna check us out, we're gonna be in breakout sessions after this as well. So I'd be happy to talk to you about it. All right. All right, so now we're going to go out west really quickly uh, to the University of Oregon. Uh, we are a public research institution of around 23,000 students. Uh, we are located in the number one green city in the U.S., which is Eugene, another college town. Uh, very green environment, as you can see. Uh, our campus actually has more than 5,000 trees, <laughs> and uh, we, have, we focus a lot on sustainability and the environment in general. Um, but we have around 240 academic programs. Uh, we have students representing 100 countries around the world. So it is kind of a nice global campus feel uh, and community. Um, we focus a lot on business, sports business in particular, uh, but also journalism and architecture. We have the only uh, public law school in the state of Oregon. Um, and we also have some great programs in the sciences. We do a lot of research in marine biology. We're about one hour from the Pacific Ocean. We have our own submarines. So students are usually very attracted to that particular uh, opportunity, but also we focus a lot on neuroscience, human physiology, computer science, uh, and more. Uh, so, and finally, we do offer scholarships. A lot of them are gonna be merit-based, but we also look at financial need and other factors uh, as well. So that was just a quick overview and I'll go ahead and pass it along. Hi again, Stacy Stony Brook University. 
uh, large research comprehensive university, public university ranked in the top 1% of universities in uh, the world, uh, flagship of the State University of New York system, SUNY. Uh, we're about an hour from New York City in a pretty suburban residential community. So really close to our beaches, a uh, very harbor uh, marina like town. Um, close to campus, uh, but a train station right on campus to take you into New York City. Uh, over 4,000 international students on campus. We are ranked in the top 10 universities in the country that are considered the most diverse universities um, in the United States. Over 200 academic majors to choose from, research opportunities, clubs and organizations, internships, all of that. But I know we're running short of time, so I'm gonna pass it to our last presenter. Thank you, Stacey. Hi, everyone again. Uh, so I am with Albion College. Albion is a small private liberal arts school located in Michigan. It's halfway between Ann Arbor and Kalamazoo. So it's the southern part of Michigan. I have, we pull our hand up over here. It's like right around here. Um, we have about 1500 students on campus, 80 different degree programs. Um, a lot of our students are student athletes. So we're a D3 school. Um, so, you know, it's a fantastic place to be able to get a, an incredible education and then also be able to play the sport that you love. Um, so in terms of the financial aid piece, we do offer merit scholarships to every single student that applies to our to, um, to go to our school. And typically with international students, we have grant and endowment money that we're able to support. Um, so there will be some of that available to you as well. Our international population is ever growing um, because we're such a tiny bitty school. Right now we have about 50 international students and we're continuing to grow. Um, but I will also be available after this uh, to learn a little bit more about LBN and I can share a little bit more about, you know, options and availability for institutes and, and departments and whatnot. So thank you. And so here quickly is our contact information. Um, our email addresses, you can take a quick uh, picture or screenshot. And I know I'm going to pass it over for some uh, Q&A from uh, all of you. Uh, so I'll pass it back to Education USA. Yes, Stacy, thank you so much. You did a wonderful job here, right on top. And we had several questions on the Q&A box here, the written questions. And I'm sure you have other questions in the particular rooms that you'll be. I will just transition again to Portuguese just to ask people to move to the links. Pessoal que está aqui nessa uh, sessão maravilhosa, foi incrível, vocês tiveram uma diversidade de instituições, de tipos de programas, dicas muito preciosas, que todos nós como advisors também aprendemos muito, espero que vocês tenham aproveitado. E agora, como a gente tem, praticamente não tem tempo, eu acho que nós vamos fazer a transição, que já são sete horas, para o grupo, e todos que tenham alguma pergunta uh, que não foi respondida, a gente vai poder responder, seja nas salas, seja na sala do Education USA, que vai estar disponível também agora, os links estão sendo colocados aqui no chat, e vocês podem uh, ir para esses links, tá? Uh, since we don't have time for the questions anymore, we, we are saying that we will have our Education USA room to answer any burning questions, and then they should go to your uh, specific rooms for the questions they might have, okay? I just wanted to say once again, thank you so much for being here, everyone. It was a great session. Um, Annelise said it in Portuguese, I'll say it in English. Um, it was a lot of great information for the students and for us as advisors. I have already written down some things that I will be incorporating. Yes. So thank you so much for being here. We hope you enjoyed it and we will be sending the students your way right now. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.